The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Welcome to another show of Speaking with the Senator. I'm Senator Kevin Avard, and we're going to be talking about energy today. And uh, today we're going to have uh, Dr. Mark Vodder. Uh, he's an economist, and he specializes in, in uh, energy. And uh, I want to welcome you to the show. Energy seems to be a hot topic uh, these days, and we want to get a lot of perspective that, you know, because there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of chatter out there. Why are my prices, why are my electric prices so high? Why is New England so um, uh, expensive to, to operate a business here with, 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 with the, with the uh, electric prices going on? And we offered some solutions, you know, in the legislature. And, uh, and you know, of course, we know each other. And I, I, I figured it'd be good to have you on, get your perspective. And I know that you were on uh, uh, Alderman Sh Shoneman's show. Yeah. And he's running for Senate, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. I heard about that. Well, welcome to the show. Well, anyway, yeah. Thanks yeah. for having yeah, me. Absolutely. Yeah, it's good to see you. So, uh, energy prices seem to be going up. Uh, they're going up, but uh, they've really been high for a while, and it's caused a lot of uh, uh, commotion. A lot of, uh, there have been some people who are upset. Uh, and it's it's become an economic development issue where yeah. manufacturing uh, uh, threatens to leave the state if uh, the rates don't go down. And as a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, Sig Sauer expanded in Arkansas rather than in New Hampshire because of high electric rates. It was one of their reasons. From what I also understand is there was a there was a, some tax credits involved as well. So okay. Yeah, so that, that, that was one of the issues that, uh, that, that was affecting. But it's still, you know, the, the camel that breaks the, 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 the back of the, it, or the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's certainly one of the reasons they mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's actually easy to, to document that uh, rates in New England are higher. And I want to talk about, I want to talk about one component of those rates because this is the component of rates that is, um, different in New England than it is in any other part of the country. And that is transmission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we had a study committee uh, basically talking about transmission, distribution, and generation. And one of the, the factors that, that came was glaring since 2005, maybe even more, the transmission costs have gone up at least 500%. Some say 400, some say 550. So I'm, I'm putting it in the middle. and. I had asked ISO, so, you know, is there a way that we could, you know, some say that we're gold plating our, our transmission uh, grid, if you will, and we're part of that grid. I said, well, could you just silver plate it instead of gold plating it? Why are we so expensive with our transmission costs? A lot of it had to do with what the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has um, identified as a flawed process for setting transmission rates and approving transmission costs. The, in their own words, it's flawed. In the words of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the rates were unjust, unreasonable, unduly discriminatory, and preferential. Where can somebody find that quote? Okay, uh, you can look up two, doc two dockets on the FERC website. One is EL16-19-000. And the other is ER. 18-2235, um, and it's called the formula rate proceeding. Let me show a graph, and uh, uh, just to uh, give some context, and okay. um, and we're going to go we're going to go back a couple of years to December of uh, 2015, 
So this, this graph comes from an article by Dave Solomon in the Union Leader from January of 2016. Mm -hmm. And um, in, uh, on the left, you see uh, five years worth of uh, uh, electricity costs in New England. And then to the right of that, you see, so ISO NE is uh, the New England Independent System Operator. Uh, to the right of that, you see the California Independent System Operator, then the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, then the New York Independent System Operator. Which is relatively, uh, well, okay. And Re relatively high. But, and then there's the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland uh, Regional Transmission Organization. But if you look at the yellow part, that's the cost of commodity. We're actually doing pretty well in New England. Those yellow bars aren't really any higher than in New York or, or in New Jersey. They're okay. a little higher than they are in California, but we're not doing that badly. We've actually seen the cost of electric commodity fall in the last 10 or 20 years uh, under uh, restructuring and development of the wholesale market. But that purple component is transmission. On the bottom. That's right. right? Yep. And that's what, that's what makes those New England bars higher than the bars for all of the other parts of the country. I see that, yeah. And, um, and so what, how that came to pass um, is uh, a complex subject. Uh, I think uh, probably some gold plating was involved. I think uh, some cost overruns were involved. And when we say gold plating, we're talking about reliability and making sure that uh, they're, they're super reliable, I well, guess. Well, what they do is they earn a, a rate of return, a guaranteed rate of return on every dollar they invest. So that gives them an incentive to invest a lot. And that rate of return is? And the rate of return they were allowed was between 9 and 12%. And this is at a time when interest rates were zero. So uh, that's part of why those purple bars are so high is because they were allowed some very high rates of return, the transmission owners. Now, the heart of, of, of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's investigation, which began a month before Dave Solomon wrote this article, and he wrote this article about the initiation of that investigation, the heart of, 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 of FERC's allegations is that the process by which transmission rates were set was uh, lacked transparency and didn't have adequate procedures in place whereby um, parties could challenge the rates and the costs that were being built into rates. And, um, and, and the settlement negotiations began at that time. Um, and what's, and there's really been not a lot of news coming out of it. You know, uh, no leaks, and um, no leaks, <laughs> <laughs> no leaks, uh, and um, what's coming out of the settlement is a reformed process and and formula for setting transmission rates at the independent system operator in New England. And when will that take effect? Ah, so we're at a crucial stage right now. Because uh, the parties agreed to a settlement on August 17th. And this settlement was... Of, uh, of this year? Of this year. Yeah. Just about a little over a month ago. And it's not been approved by the uh, commission yet. So um, uh, comments have been filed just in the last few days. Generally supportive. Uh, I mean, all these parties. Now, I, I, I want to say... With, with all due respect, that, that, that all of the public utilities commissions in New England ha were parties to this settlement negotiation, and okay. they have agreed to it. And the New England State's Committee on Electricity, whose members are appointed by the governors of the New England states, filed supportive comments. And the Massachusetts Attorney General filed supportive comments. So clearly, uh, this, uh, the, new, the new process for setting transmission rates that is coming out of this settlement is an improvement over the old process. So just for, to recap, uh, since 2005, transmission costs have, have risen at least 500%. That's right. And the transmission 
are, are basically, I, I like the, the viewers to, to just picture those big fat power lines, the okay. big ones. That, that, that carry the heavy load. Yeah, this is the high voltage, high voltage. long distance right. transmission. And those costs are, are, are you know, guarantee uh, to, to keep those things maintained it, it, it's a, between 9 and 10% or 12% return. That's what they were A given. guarantee return for those that are invested in those big fat power lines. Mm -hmm. And those costs have risen up, like you said, because interest rates have been flat. They've been zero. They've been, they've been, they're. they're no, no th this is interesting because. Uh, uh, you know, Mike Harrington, a, a former PUC commissioner and a, a state rep. I know him well. I'm sure you do. <laughs> but uh, he, he pointed out at, uh, at the time, he was quoted in this article that Solomon wrote that, you know, it's hard to justify rates of return that high when interest rates are that low. Now interest rates are going up. Some. They've been on, uh, I think, three or four times they've gone up, or maybe even a little more. But I just wanted the folks to, to, to get the concept that, that these are the, the big fat power lines, and, and the reason they're, it's so expensive is that there, there is a, a degree of reliability that we want in our grid. Yeah, We're we part of this grid. New Hampshire has a 9.6 responsibility to keep that, that, that portion mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. That's our responsibility mm -hmm. of, of the big pie, if you yeah. will. Yeah. And so... Uh, in order to reduce our dependency, some have been saying, mm -hmm. on these transmission lines, okay. we'll reduce our costs yep. and our rates. And so everybody's scurrying to, to, to try to reduce uh, our big, uh, our dependency on those big fat power lines by, by generating our own right. locally. So what can we do about this? And certainly, given these high transmission rates, which again, you know, I mean, we want, we want reliable transmission, but if you look at the graph, mm -hmm. you, you, I don't suppose the people in New Jersey or New York or California want anything less reliable than we have here, but for some reason we're paying a lot more. And uh, we recently drove through New Jersey, yeah. New York, from Virginia, and you see these transmission lines everywhere. Yeah. It, it's ungodly. It's, uh, it's ugly. There's a lot of people. Well, there's a lot of people. <laughs> but look yeah. at their costs compared to ours. Yeah, they're quite low compared to ours so uh this is and and again the 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 FERC you know thinks that this is the result of a flawed process that lack transparency and FERC is again the federal energy regulatory commission yep. and they oversee the iso's process they're the federal equivalent of the public utilities commission okay and uh and they i they thought that they alleged that the um, process was unfair. The process was lacking in transparency and lacking procedures whereby interested parties could challenge mm -hmm. the costs that were being built into rates. And so now we have a settlement and there's a new process that's going to come out of it. Will the rate payers benefit from that or will the uh, regula regulated uh, uh, organizations, uh, regulators, tr transmission owners. Will they will they give that money back to the ratepayers? Yeah, is this a good deal for the ratepayers? I'm. Or is it for the f good for the uh, the transmission owners? It, it's a very interesting question. Now, again, uh, the public utilities commissions are part were parties to the negotiation, and they've approved the settlement. They've agreed to this settlement. So I don't want to uh, I don't want to nitpick, but. Um, I'm, I'm concerned. I have one concern. I would like confirmation about one thing. Uh, and that's this letter that you, you brought to me. Yeah, I brought you a, I brought you a present. It's, uh, it's page four of the explanatory statement that goes with the settlement. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are a couple of sentences I'd like to read from, from, this, uh, from yep. this page. The first one says that the settlement formula rate retains a structure in which in which rates will be based initially on the prior year's revenue requirement plus projected capital additions. Now what that means is that the revenue requirement associated with all the costs that were admitted under the old flawed process are going to be grandmothered into the new rates. Okay. So whatever gold plating, excessive rates of return, cost overruns occurred because of the old flawed process that FERC has uh, alleged to be unjust, unreasonable, unduly discriminatory and preferential will be grandmothered in 
Well, that's not good. I, 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 I shouldn't think so. Now, you uh, said grandmothered. Why not grandfathered? <laughs> I'm just trying not to be sexist. No, okay. Um, but uh, let's go a little farther down the page because there is some provision for challenging the rates the uh, in the new in the new process and. So, in, again, in the old process, FERC didn't think the challenge procedures were adequate. Now, here are the new challenge procedures coming out of the settlement. The protocols allow interested parties to request discovery of relevant information pertaining to the annual revenue requirement calculations. So you can request information. And to challenge informally and, if necessary, formally, the participating transmission owner's calculation of any component of the revenue requirement. Now that sounds pretty good. But then there's this final phrase which says that they allege to be inconsistent with the settlement formula rate. So the average person that, that's looking at their, their bills, they're not going to be able to, they're not going to cha challenge anything here. So this no, is, no, this but we have, we have consumer advocates, right. the office of the consumer advocate, Don Crease. Don Crease, all right, it's his job. He's actually intervened. He's one of the parties to this settlement. And so I would be interested to see what he, to hear what he thinks about this particular language. Now this is the explanatory statement. I didn't dig through the settlement itself myself, but my concern here is that is that this settlement closes the door on 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 challenging embedded costs that are grandmothered in from the old flawed process i don't know that that's true but from what i'm reading here it's a concern mm -hmm. and uh i think now's the time to raise the concern because uh the FERC has not approved the settlement yet and um, uh, you know it's 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 a little bit it's not widely understood, but it it means a lot to electric rates. It's the main reason why our rates are high. Um, these old high costs should be open to challenge. I think still in seeing the new how process. they were deemed by their own admission that they were unfair. Well, the FERC found them to be unjust. Okay, and so. And so, in this new reform process, are we going to are we going to grandmother in the old costs, or are we going to open them to challenge? Right. And what can we do as a legislator to to to, uh, to open up that door for challenging and transparency? Yeah. Procedurally, I'm not sure what the options are. Um, this is one of the reasons why I personally think, I, and, and this gets complicated. Yeah, and and the the average consumer doesn't realize the, 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 all the the gears into into this just building block of system that we have. Yeah, but this is one of the reasons why we brought in the net metering bill. Okay, you know, and 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 the reason we did, and that's only five megawatts here, five megawatts, three megawatts, two. Sure. Nashua would have benefited uh, handsomely from this, so they would have been able to generate three megawatts through Mine Falls. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's another one at uh, Margaritas; they generate up to a megawatt. There. I thought Mine Falls was 1.3 megawatts. And, uh, no, it's three. Oh, I goofed. Yeah, sorry. But uh, either way, I mean, they can go up to five megawatts, and, and and the reason we were rushing to that is to to reduce our dependency on transmission, mm. which translates in our our. Which, which lowers our bill. And, and again, you know, if you're going to be paying transmission rates as high as you see in that graph, well, one thing you can do is to argue that they should be lower, and another thing you could do is avoid paying them. And one of the ways of avoid paying them is by allowing self-generation. Distributed generation. So one of the things that, that it's, it's hard to get this concept across, because you brought up the idea of subsidy. Right there, th we subsidize cer certain bio plants, and we subsidize, say, net metered to a degree. Well, it depends on what source is being net metered. But just as a general, just give me that just for a second. So now, well, wait a minute. We got a guarantee written rate of return on the owners on these transmission lines between nine and twelve yeah. percent. That is a sweetheart deal. Sure that the ratepayers are subsidizing. Yeah, I would say so. So you're subsidizing the the infrastructure. The transmission it, owners. The transmission owners, or you're subsidizing self-generation. And I, I submit to you that the self-generation 
is a lot less. And that's why there's this, this whole concept of, and, and, and by self-generation, you're also creating a, a degree of reliability. We got here with these bio plants and, and the whole nine yards because years ago, mm -hmm. from my understanding, yep. you can correct me if I'm wrong, yep. that we had an over-dependency on oil. We, we, had, and, we and, had more oil-fired plants than any other part of the country. Correct. And yeah, so the other, part of the, other parts of the country had moved away from oil, and, and we, kept, we kept using it. And, and it got expensive. At times, oil gets and, expensive. And dirty. At times, it's cheap. Yeah. Oil's it's, like that. It's, it's, but the, pro the problem is we had an over-dependency on one particular fuel. Uh, fuel. So the legislature, in its wisdom, said, you know what? Let's, let's promote the idea of uh, some of these bio plants or, or mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. other alternatives yeah. in, in case we lose this, this oil. Yeah, let's hedge our risk. Right. Diversify. And so we, we, we diversified, and then we just switched the pendulum from oil to gas. Please. There's really one reason we did that. And, of course, gas is cheap. Gas is cheap. And that's fine. Yeah. But as long as it's cheap, it's good stuff. Right. But then again, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. And, of course, we have the nuclear power plant as well. But yeah. Uh, uh, the bottom line is we, we wanted to come up with other alternatives, other sources. Some, some people really sure. want clean energy, uh, hydro and, 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 and solar. Yep. Uh, so we, we, we incentivized. Yep. And so that whole concept was to reduce dependency on one or the other. Now I'm seeing this other thing called transmission. Yep. That we want to reduce our dependency on that as yep. well. Yeah. So... You are subsidizing that through your rate to a degree because... Not necessarily. But a guarantee rate of return. No. Oh, oh, transmission. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, but distributed generation... That's, that's, the little, that's the little lines. Yeah. So we can, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can encourage distributed generation in a way that doesn't involve subsidies if we use a good rate design. Right. And, and distri distribution, by the way, is they get a guarantee rate of return of 9.6%. Sure, sure. Distributed generation will defray distribution costs. It'll defray transmission costs. Mm -hmm. But it it but some sources of distributed generation do a better job than others because those those systems, the transmission system and the distribution system are built to meet peak load. Now, is ISO involved with distribution? Not directly. Um uh they uh they don't. They don't own the distribution lines. They don't. Uh, uh, they dispatch generation, which is transmitted over transmission and distribution lines. But um, the rates for distribution are set uh, in processes before the state public utilities commission, whereas the ISO's transmission rates are set before the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So we have four minutes. This okay. is going by really quick. Uh, okay. What's a good takeaway from people that are just watching us banter back and forth here a little bit? Yeah. yeah. What, there's, a, there's a huge dependency on these transmission lines. Yeah. The unfair rates mm -hmm. are potentially going to be grandfathered in. Or grandmothered in. Or grandmothered in. And there is a process to appeal. Yeah. Uh, who's going to do the appealing? Yeah. I mean... My concern, I just want to raise it, and I want people to, to pay attention to the issue because, <coughs> because it means a lot for our rates. Mm -hmm. um, Don Kreese could sit here and tell you the new process. I'm going to get him back on this. <laughs> I've had him here. Oh, good. Yeah. He could sit here and tell you, you know, this new process is going to give us all the authority we need to challenge all costs that factor in to our transmission rates. And the question is, who is we? Well, in, in his case, he's the Office of the Consumer Advocate, and he advocates for the interests of ratepayers. And how powerful is he to, to make any changes? Well, um, he, he can intervene in, in rate proceedings. Uh, he, can, he can argue that some costs are not prudent, not justified, and uh, uh, he can make the case that some costs should not be allowed uh, in to the revenue requirement to the rate base, what we call the rate base. Now, he could come here and say, this settlement gives me all the power I need to 
challenge those costs. <coughs> I don't know what he would say. But when I look at this language, uh, it raises a, a concern for me that he won't have that authority in the settlement. And I, w I would like confirmation, and I think that's what we should be looking for at this point. I'll reach out to him to, to come on the show and talk about the specific and, uh, uh, situation. Yeah. Yeah. Confirmation that this settlement gives him the authority he needs to challenge old embedded costs that were built in the rates under the old flawed process. And if he does not have that authority, then we're, we're really... Uh, I don't know what our options are at that point, because he's... You know, we've already, everybody who represents the rate payers in this settlement negotiation has agreed to this settlement. And if the FERC approves it, um, I don't know, I don't know what, what recourse there will be. Better, better to ask a lawyer, but as an economist, uh, I just want to say that, you know, these transmission rates are extraordinarily high. And uh, they were set in a flawed process. And it would be nice if we could shift some of those costs back onto transmission owners. All right. If people want to get in touch with you and ask you questions about this, do you have a website? Or? Yeah. My website is appliedecon.net. Appliedecon.net. That's correct. All right. And do, do you advise corporations? Or who do you consult with? I'm an expert witness. Uh, generators, we do a lot of studies for power generators. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, I've been doing a lot of work in Mexico. Uh, because they've they've just undergone a, a major uh, reform of their energy sector, and there's a lot of uh, 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 firms that want to build generation there. And so, so we've been doing studies for power plant uh, construction and uh, economic viability. And um, does, does New Hampshire need to generate some more uh, its own electricity? I think we should encourage all cost-effective generation through an appropriate net metering rate design. And with that, we're going to say <laughs> thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks very, for having me. Very uh, informative, and uh, we're still working on the problem. As you can see, this situation is, uh, is complicated. So we're trying to come up with solutions, and uh, we hope that this is giving you an understanding of some of the, the, the weeds uh, that we, we're, we're trying to weed through. So until next week, thanks for watching Speaking with the Senator. I'm Kevin Avard, and we'll see you then. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.